All right, well, beloved, we are moving a lot of scripture again today. And you know, this Romans chapter 8 is probably one of the richest chapters in all the scripture. There is so much deep, convicting, soul-leading <coughs> truth in Romans chapter 8 that to cover the amount of verses that we're going to cover tonight is only to touch the surface. There is just that much good truth, solid biblical truth in these verses tonight. And so tonight we're looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. And uh, before we read the word of God, what we'll do is we'll open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank and praise you for allowing us to be here on this mid-Wednesday night. We recognize, Lord, that it's you who has sustained us and provided for us. And we just bless you tonight, Lord, because it's you, Lord, who has saved us from our sins. Lord, you gave us a gift that we could not uh, you know, otherwise give to ourselves, even on our best day, Lord. And so we just praise you, Lord, for the matchless gift of salvation. And tonight, Lord, as we open up your word, Lord, we pray that you would sanctify us by the truth, for your word is truth. And we pray that you would plant your word in our hearts, Lord, that we may not sin against you. And we ask that you would forgive us of those times, Lord, that we have sinned against you. Cleanse our hearts and our minds, Lord. Strengthen us in the areas that we are weak. Because, Lord, we want our lives to honor you and we want our lives to be a witness for you in this, this dark world in which we live. So, Lord, teach us, Lord, by your spirit tonight, your truth. Help us, Lord, to live by it. We pray, Lord, for our nation's leaders as well. And we pray even, Lord, for our local and city government leaders. And so be with them and grant to them wisdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. I'm going to read from the NASB tonight. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. And uh, this is what the Word of God says. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes? for what he already sees. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because 
He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew. He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. 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 And so this is freedom for the future. Freedom for the future. And you know, when we look at Scripture, one of the truths that are unpacked and shown to us through the pages of Scripture regarding the character and the nature of God is God's faithfulness. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Apostle Paul simply says, God is faithful. And you know the words, God is faithful, even make sense when you say it backwards. Mm -hmm. Faithful mm -hmm. is God. And so, what we know as followers of Christ is God has been faithful in our past. God has been faithful in our present, and God will be faithful in our future. And since we're talking about freedom for the future tonight, it's important for us to know that God will be faithful even in the future. Because, as many of us know, it's easy for us to affirm the faithfulness of God in our heads, right? We can say God is faithful in our heads, but it's difficult to grasp at times the faithfulness of God in our hearts, especially when trouble or trials come, right? When trouble when trial, when suffering enters our lives, aren't we all tempted to question whether or not God is faithful? I mean, that temptation can come in your mind, right? Yes. We're all tempted to question the faithfulness of God. When our lives going through a difficult season every Christian no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord can be faced with that temptation to doubt the faithfulness of God. Y'all remember Job don't you? Job went through a lot of difficulty in his life but yet Job didn't understand that even with the difficulty that he was facing, God was still remaining faithful. Job didn't know why he was going through what he was going through. And the truth of the matter is, we may never know why we went through what it is that we had to go through. But the thing we need to know and always remember is God is faithful and because God is faithful what we go through our pain our trouble our trial our difficulty is not an accident to God 
It's not an accident to God. As a matter of fact, before it happens to us, it's already been surveyed and passed through the hands of a faithful God. So, as we dig into this text tonight, understand that no matter what we go through in this life, whether it be in our present or whether it be in our future, God is going to remain faithful and God will never be surprised. We don't ever have to worry about catching God by surprise based upon the suffering that we experience in this life. And sometimes suffering can come in all different forms, can't it? It's the, it's the ones that are least expected that kind of catches off guard, right? Those diagnoses, those unexpected surgeries, those things catch us off guard. And even though we may be tempted to doubt the faithfulness of God, always remember, God will remain faithful. Amen. And so Romans chapter 8, verse 17. This is a foundational verse, although our text is starting at verse 18. I think it's important for us to understand the verse before the Romans chapter 8, verse 18. And that's verse 17. Because it talks about the fact that we are children of God. We are children of God, and if children, heirs, also heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may be also glorified with Him. So, the whole aspect of suffering <coughs> Suffering is the umbrella topic of which we are speaking from. Because the first verse that we see in chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. This is one of those verses when we feel like our lives are going through the south part of Gehenna. <laughs> when you feel like your life is going through the south part <laughs> of hell, this is one of those verses where you can just put this particular verse to memory because when we consider our sufferings our sufferings for Christ in light of the glory that is to be revealed in us our sufferings are a very small price to pay when you think about eternal life from the big picture, when you think about your life from the big picture, the suffering that we go through, and, and you know, sometimes I use that word go through a little too loosely because I, the point of suffering is not merely to go through it. The point of suffering is to grow Grow, G-R-O-W, grow through it. Because as we all know, there are a lot of people who simply just go through suffering. They're not learning nothing from the suffering. They're not using the suffering as an aid, as a tool to help them to know God's way, God's will 
for their life. They're just simply just going through it instead of growing through it. And when we go through these particular verses, understand this. We never want to minimize suffering. <laughs> I'm not trying to minimize suffering. Because suffering, no matter what shape, form it comes in, is always painful. It's painful with a capital P. And so, although suffering is painful, I believe it's important for us as Christians to put our suffering in their proper biblical context. As Christians. I'm not speaking as or to individuals who are not Christians. I'm speaking to us as a group of Christians. I think it's important for us that when we encounter, Christ, encounter suffering, that we put our suffering into its proper biblical context. And our suffering, as the text says, our suffering our sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed in us. <laughs> and that word worthy, y'all see that word worthy? Mm -hmm. That word worthy. Worthy is uh, Yes. And it, it basically what it means is to to put to weigh on the scale. So I'm gonna, throw, I'm gonna draw a little scale right here. It's gonna look like a hangman though, but you know. But it's a scale. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's a scale. That's a scale. <laughs> That's a scale. It looked like a hangman, but trust me, it's a scale. <laughs> but when we look at the word worthy, worthy. It, the, the picture is to weigh our suffering on the scale. And you may, well, what are we weighing it on the, on the scale in comparison with? Well, the glory to be revealed in us. So on one side of the scale, let's put an S, you got your suffering. On the other side of the scale, you got glory. I put an S and a G up there. The S for our sufferings, the G for the glory that is to be revealed. And the point of worthy is, is it's our sufferings aren't even worth comparing to the glory, the future glory that is to be revealed in us. And so this word revealed, apocalypto, apocalypto is the word reveal. It means to uncover, to disclose and it ultimately refers to when Jesus is going to return and set all things in their proper place so one of the first things that Christians always get accused of being is uh, talking all that pie in the sky stuff but this is not pie in the sky theology as we'll see this is not pie in the sky theology. This is something that is sound for us while we're here on the ground. Because our momentary and light afflictions are working for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 
4. 16, somebody get that 4, 16, and 17. <clears throat> Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Right. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory when, that yeah. far outweighs them all. Yes, yes. And so, in view of a biblical view, having a biblical view of our suffering means that we have an understanding that our suffering in view of eternity, in light of the glory that is to be revealed in us, eternity, our suffering just lasts for a moment. Eternity is going to last forever. It's a momentary light affliction that is working for us a far more exceeding weight eternal weight of glory because one day every single believer in Christ is going to share in the future glory, the glory that Christ has himself. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has prepared for those who love him. And so, our suffering is not worth even comparing to the glory to be revealed in us. But Christians, we will suffer. Suffering will be painful. We will not leave this life unscathed by the impact and the effect of suffering. Christians get sick. Christians lose loved ones. Christians experience the loss of Relationships through divorce. Christians experience job loss. I mean, we, we're not going to leave this world unscathed. So, knowing that we're not going to leave this world unscathed, unimpacted by suffering, should put our focus not just on the suffering itself, but the glory that is to be revealed in us. All right? Mm -hmm. That's just verse 18. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at 19 to 25, it's not that we suffer individually. Because the reason why I say that is when you're going through suffering, right? Sometimes we can frame our suffering as though we're the only ones experiencing that suffering at the moment. Mm -hmm. But it's not just us that suffering. Creation as a whole is suffering. Look, look at what he says. In, 20, in 19 to 25, we're going to read it. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For well, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves suffer the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. In hope we have been 
say, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. And so, unless you've been hiding under a rock <laughs> for most of your life, when you look at the world around us, we know that there's something wrong, right? There's something wrong with the world in which we live. I mean, even with all the technological and scientific breakthroughs, medical breakthroughs that we have, it's like they're sending people to space every other week, it seems like, a month or something. Once a month or something, it seems like somebody's sending a rocket to space. With all the advancements that we made. You know, I think about sometimes what it would be like if some of my loved ones who who died before the computer came into the being, or if they came back, they probably would think we was like Star Trek or something like that. You know, when you got this little phone that's really a mini computer that you can send messages and talk and communicate to people. You know, I have loved ones that died before there was any such thing as a personal computer. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder what they would think if they came back and saw all this. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that with all that that we have experienced, <coughs> we cannot escape the fact that our world is fallen. Can we? With all the stuff that we see, I mean, we know that our world is fallen. When you look at the news, you know, if you watch too much of the news, the news will make you sad. I mean, if that's all you do, if you watch that 24-hour news cycle, it's like, is anything good going on in the world? But when we watch the news, read the newspapers, you see war, you see crime, you see economic problems, you see poverty, and all this stuff points to the fact that our world is fallen. It's fallen. The world, as beautiful as it is, Still marred by sin. The effects of sin. I mean, when you look at the birds, I'll give you a story. I was outside cutting my grass one day. As beautiful as birds are, there was a blue jay flying around. I'm outside my backyard, right? Here comes a hawk. Oh, yeah. I the hawk comes chasing after the blue jay. I mean, the blue jay was like, <laughs> I mean, doing its best to get away from the hawk. The blue jay had to fly into the grass to keep from being food for the hawk. <laughs> I mean, and this was a nice sized hawk. I mean, it perched itself up on the family I mean, and its little, it's what well, I call it a little beak. I mean, it was very well defined in its claws. I'm like, man, it was looking for that blue jay. But that's an indicator that our world, there's something wrong here. It's fallen. I mean, creation is fallen. Every single atom is fallen. The oceans, the seas, the wildlife, the insects. If you ain't careful, you get stung by an insect, it might kill you. It's fallen. Everything in the created order is fallen. Well, it tells you that in the Bible, before the end of time, that all this is going to happen to the 
Yes, to some you know, extent. You know, yes, it does. Yes. 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 But although creation is falling, creation is waiting because this is what he says in verse 19. Coming back to Romans 8, verse 19. For the anxious longing of creation waits with, waits with, it says the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For, in verse 19, is basically pointing us back to everything that Paul was talking about prior to that. It connects us back to what he said in verse 18. We suffer. Creation is suffering at the same time. And creation is waiting for the revealing. The apocalypsis. Creation is waiting for the revealing. The Y'all but get get Revelation one more. It's it's waiting for the revealing. What is uh, Revelation one one two? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. It talks about the revealing. You ever heard of apocalypse or apocalyptic literature? That's where that word comes from. It's it's where we get our English word revelation from. This revealing. Revealing who? Revealing the true sons of God. Because there are many people who say they're Christians but are not Christians. But there is coming a day where all true Christians, the true sons of God, will be revealed. He goes on to talk about creation because he says creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. What is it telling us there? It's telling us, beloved, that creation is cursed. And how did creation become cursed? Well, when Adam and Eve sinned, we go back to the Genesis account, right? We go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. And in Genesis 3, 17 to 19, it says, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you should eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face, the sweat of your brow. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you will return. And so creation was put in subjection. That's another key word, subjection. Subjection. And it's hupo. <coughs> hupo, tasso. Hupo meaning under. Tasso meaning to Arrange. So it's it's two words. It's the hoopo and the tasso. And that means the hoopo is the under. The tasso is to arrange or arrange in its 
order. And so creation was put in subjection, in submission by God. In other words, creation is longing for its own redemption, but it cannot achieve the purpose that it desires, that it originally was intended to be. Creation was not designed to be this way. It wasn't designed to be like this from the beginning. And so because of the disobedience of one man, Romans 5 and 12, right? Romans 5 and 12. Now we got corruption. Now we got disease. Now we got natural disasters. And corruption, disease, natural disaster, suffering. None of those things will stop until the one who put creation in subjection returns. Let's look at Revelation 21, 21, because this talks about what? The new heaven and the new earth, right? There's a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, John, he says, then I saw a, a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea. Then let's go to 2 Peter. We're going to fingertip just a little bit. 2 Peter 3.13. 2 Peter 3.13. Look at what the Word of God says in 2 Peter 3.13. It says, but according to His promise, we are looking for what? This is all about the future. New heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So coming back to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Verse 20. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Him who subjected it in hope. That's another key word, hope. H-O-P-E. Hope. Because what we need to understand is what hope is all about. See, hope is not like wishing Wishing that you're going to get uh, something special to drink or wishing that you're going to get a mansion and a yacht. But <laughs> hope is a confident expectation of what is going to happen in the future. So God subjected creation in the hope, in the confident expectation, knowing that creation would one day be delivered. Creation would be, as it says in verse 21, itself would be set free from its slavery. Do y'all see that in verse 21? Creation is in slavery. Creation wants to have freedom for the future. Just as we long for freedom from our sin corrupted bodies, creation is longing for freedom is, as well. So, as a result of Adam's sin, creation failed. But as a result of the righteousness of Jesus, guess what? One day, there's going to be redemption and restoration. You may say, what are you talking about? How do you know that? Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. 
And let's start at verse 12. And we'll read to verse 21. Therefore, just as though through one man sin into the world, through one man, that one man was Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death spread. See, Adam was our representative on earth. He was our representative on earth. The one man. So death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. That's the reason why folk died. Who is a type of him who was to come? But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as though as through one transgression there resulted in condemnation to all men, even so through the one act of righteousness there resulted in justification of life to all men. For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, Yes, creation is waiting for its redemption, its restoration, and its groaning, as verse 22 says. Creation groans. It suffers the pains of childbirth. Coming back to Romans 8, it's groaning. And the groaning is figurative language. Figurative language that expresses uh, the utterances of a bad situation. A bad situation in which there is no immediate prospect of deliverance. The universe is groaning together with the pains of childbirth. Birth pains, like a woman who, sisters, y'all know what I'm talking about. A woman travailing in labor. Y'all know exactly. I remember when my wife was giving birth to our kids, and, you know, before they would give her one of them shots, I mean, you can see them little things going off the grid, you know, that, that measures the pain, and you're like, man, didn't you feel that? <laughs> and so, Earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, hurricanes. A couple weeks ago, we experienced what? A tornado. Those are birth pains. And so creation is groaning, as verse 23 tells us. It's groaning for its deliverance. And as what well, verse 22 tells us, but verse 23 tells us that uh, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan as well. We are groaning within ourselves, 
waiting eagerly for our own adoption, the redemption of our body. Every Christian, if you are truly <coughs> groans over the sin that is present in our lives because we suffer the effects, the pain, as a result of living in a fallen, sin-sick world. But yet we know that in the future, a bumper crop is coming. A harvest is coming. A harvest of first fruits is what the, the, the scripture says in the text. The first fruits. We have the first fruits. Fruits of the Spirit. And so the first fruits in biblical times simply represented a portion that was set aside specifically for the law. It was the first fruits. It was the first portion of the bumper crop that was seen as an installment on what was to come. So if the first fruit was good, you knew that what was coming behind the first fruit was going to be good. And so the presentation of the first fruits before God in Old Testament culture, Old Testament economy, was an act of worship. It was an act of worship. So when the text says that we have the first fruits, the first fruits of the Spirit, it means that we as the children of God have already received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Guaranteeing what is to come. Y'all looking at me funny. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15 to 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20. See, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 20, Christ is spoken of as the first fruits of the resurrection. This is what the Word of God says. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The first fruit of all or, or of those who are asleep. 21. For since by a man came death, by a man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. See, if you in Adam, you're going to die. So also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands the kingdom over to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. So even though we got the first fruits of the Spirit, we still find ourselves groaning, groaning within. And so, when we come back to Romans chapter 8, and we look at verse 24, we come back to this word hope again. You know, he used it in verse 20. Now we come back to hope again in verse 24. For in hope we have been saved. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already has? Our hope, which is a confident expectation of the future, cannot be separated from our salvation. 
our hope. This is the reason why I say when, I'm, when we're talking about the future, we're not talking about pie in the sky. Theology, again, that's the reason why I said it earlier, because we're talking about a confident expectation. It's a joyful expectation that what God promised, he is going to bring to pass. And so we don't hope for what we see. Do you hope for what you see? Do you hope for what you already have? I mean, if you got it, what you need to hope for? Right? And so, we don't hope for what we see. We hope for that in which we cannot see. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait for it with perseverance. We wait for it eagerly. We wait with perseverance for it eagerly. And so when we wait, it's not, we're, it's not like we're just sitting around doing nothing. We're waiting with perseverance. We're waiting with the understanding that he who began a good work in us shall read he shall complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. So let's look at verses 26 because we've seen that there's suffering. We've seen that creation is growing. The world is falling. But then we're seeing that there's also the Spirit's help in 26 to 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in weaknesses, in our weaknesses. But we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit is oftentimes uh, treated as a, a forgotten help. But the Holy Spirit is necessary for us to live spirit-filled, spirit-controlled lives. Because the text says, in the same way, in the same way, and again, it points back. You see how all these are connected together? In the same way, it points back to what Paul has been unpacking starting in verse 18, from 18 to 25. In the same way, in other words, in the same way that hope sustains us in the midst of our present sufferings, the Holy Spirit sustains us, sustains us, aids us, helps us in our, weak, in our weaknesses. Because the word helps is to take part in. Take part in, share in another's burden. And so the Holy Spirit helps us. It helps us. And this is not referring to physical weaknesses. This is spiritual weakness. Because when suffering comes, one of the first things that goes is what? A lot of times, pray. Hence, he says in verse 26, we don't even know what we are to pray for. We ask him for all kinds of stuff. But what the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. When we can't pray, the Holy Spirit does pray. Have you ever got the prayer knocked out of you before? Have you ever been through a situation so bad? That you didn't even have words to express the pain that you was feeling in your heart. Well, that's when the Holy Spirit kicks in. When you can't pray, the Holy Spirit is praying. Lining your prayers up, lining our prayers up with the will of God. Hence, verse 27 says, and he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Holy Spirit.
Spirit lines our prayers up because, you know, we, if, if we ain't careful, we'll mess around and be praying, praying some and get them God prayers. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody done hurt us real bad. <laughs> you know, we, we pray some and get them God. Get them, Lord. Lord, I want you to get them. But thanks be to God, he lines our prayers up with God's will. He knows what to pray. And, and, and just by way of exploration, you know, do we really understand what God's will is? His good, pleasing, and perfect will. God wants us to understand his will. And God's will is that we first of all be saved. God's will that we be saved. God's will is that we be spirit-filled. God's will that we be saved is found in 2 Peter 3 and 9. God's will that we be spirit-filled is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 to 18. God's will that is that we be sanctified, that we be holy, that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. God's will is that we be submissive, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. God's will is that we be suffering. Uh-oh. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. And if we're saved, if we're spirit-filled, if we're sanctified, if we're submissive, if we're suffering, if those things are true in our lives, then guess what? You're in the will of God. <laughs> You're in the will of God. But let's jump down to... Verse 28 to 30. Verse 28 to 30. And it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's verse 28. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these he, whom he predestined, he also called, and, and these whom he called, he also justified, and, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. There's a lot in that, right? Sure is. There's a lot in that. Especially, we, we love to quote Romans 8.28, right? But have you ever noticed we quote Romans 8.28, divorced from Romans 8.29 to 30? <laughs> You know, because the text says, if you know this clearly, it says, and we know, right? Mm -hmm. And we know. And the question is, is who is the we? <laughs> you know, because I didn't see people who not even say quote Romans 8.28, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the we? It's Christians. Born again Christians. The we equals Christians. And I ain't speaking French. I don't even know French, but that equals Christians. Born again Christians. And we know. We know all things and all things are what the best things and the worst things our success our failures our pain our doubts our disappointments our fears our unfaithfulness our triumphs even what we consider tragic God uses all things, all things that he says, and we know they, he says they work together. Work together. Y'all see that? It is E. Y'all want me to read it? Together is an E. I just made it kind of big. But yeah. All things work together. 
Sunergo. All things work together. It's from where we get, y'all ever heard of uh, the word, this word right here, synergism? All things work together. That synergism and synergism carries what? The, the, the picture of different elements working together simultaneously to achieve a purpose. So God is causing all the things that we experience in life to work together for good. God is weaving all the suffering, all the temptation, all the trouble. He's working that together, <coughs> weaving all that together for good. But 828, it makes some qualifying statements, don't it? For those, for it's worked together for good for who? Those who love God. <laughs> but the, the, the first qualifying statement is those who love God. And, and here's the question. I'm going to put a question mark right there. Who are, who are those who love God? And I mean, can everybody say, I love God? Those who love God are those who have received the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith. So, not only those who love God, those who are called those who are called who are called according to what? According to his purpose. His purpose. You know, it, it, it's not that, that God is trying to help us live our best life now. Well. Uh, you know, it's His purpose. <laughs> I think sometimes we miss it. You know what I'm saying? We, we think it's our purpose. It's His purpose. God's purpose. And so, the called. The called are those who are Christians. Those are the call. And when we start getting into the calling of God, we need to understand that when God calls us, he doesn't call us on the basis of what we can do. It's not about our ability. He calls us based upon what Christ has already done. Somebody get 2 Timothy 1 and 9. And then somebody get Romans 9 and 6. 9 and 16, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Mm -hmm. Romans 9 and 16. I'll read 9. Romans. I mean, 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which he granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity not according to our works but according to what 
according to his own purpose, not our purpose, and grace which was granted to us, granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Somebody got the Romans uh, 9.16? Romans 9.16? It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Our calling does not depend on our effort. It's on God's mercy. So what are we saying about this? We say, as Jesus said in John 6, 65, John chapter 6, verse 65. No one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. We just can't make up our mind and decide we're going to get called. Our calling is not about our choosing God, but God choosing us. God's choice precedes our choice. It's God's choice that makes our choice possible and effective. And so, it's God's purpose, not our purpose. It's God's calling, not our calling. Then when you go to verse 29, for those whom he, and we just, you know, surface on this, for new. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 29, introduces this, this concept called uh, it's often called the golden chain. It's the golden chain. It's the golden chain of salvation. Because I mean, there are some there's some words in here that are that are usually unpacked. For new, for new, eight twenty nine. For those whom he foreknew, he pre. Destined. So you got foreknew, you got predestined. And one of the, 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 the common views regarding the word foreknew, y'all know what it is? God looked down the corridors of time and God saw that. Quincy Shelton was going to give a positive response to the gospel by his own free will and on the basis of, of God's foresight, looking down through the tunnels of time, he chose to save Quincy Shelton. It's a problem with that, right? Because God does not choose anybody. Although God has the ability to look down the corridors of time, God's choice of any, of any individual is not because he knows they're going to respond. It's because God is sovereign. God chooses whomsoever he wills. And so what we, how we get it confused is, is there's this concept called, often called the order of uh, salvation. The order of salvation, right? And what we do is, is we, we, we look at the word for new, right? Because four new comes first, right? We say, well, in order of salvation, four no comes first, you know. So it, and then predestination comes second. But just because it's listed here in that word order doesn't mean that that's how salvation comes, biblically speaking. 
And so, foreknowledge comes before predestination. But that doesn't mean that predestination is what God foreknows or what how God chooses people to be saved. God doesn't choose people to be saved because he foreknows they're going to respond favorably to the gospel. I mean, that would, that would ultimately make salvation arbitrary, right? Well, I'm going to choose this person. I'm not going to choose this person. Uh, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to be nice to this person. I'm not going to be nice to this person because I know what this person is going to do and I know what this person is not going to do. So I'm just going to treat this person, I'm going to treat this person bad because I know they're a bad character. But I'm going to treat this person good because I know this person is a good character. That would make God arbitrary. God doesn't choose arbitrarily. He chooses sovereignly. So, the word foreknew, it means to know beforehand to have knowledge and if you again we we looking at this from 10,000 feet Romans chapter 9 tells us that God's foreknowledge of what we will do is not the basis of him choosing people for salvation so when it comes to knowledge there's a sense in which we have intellectual awareness and intimate awareness of another person. Jeremiah 1 5. God says, Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Before you were born, I consecrated you and appointed you to be a prophet. So the word knew, yada, it means to have a intimate relationship with him. So before Jeremiah was born, God was intimately aware in relationship with him. The word predestined comes from the word to, to see on the horizon, which is a boundary marker between heaven and earth. So, a lot of people say predestined. Predestined means to decree or determine the destiny of a person before that person has had a chance to even choose redemption. That's not what God does. God is not choosing people before they even have a chance to respond to the gospel. Everybody gets a chance to hear the gospel. There are no individuals who will not get a chance to respond favorably to the gospel. God is not working to actively cause unbelief in the hearts of any human being. He's not working to cause unbelief in the heart of any human being. If that was the case, why do we sing, uh, Why on earth thou art called me, do not pass me by. Because we understand that God is not working to cause unbelief. While on others thou are calling, do not pass me by. So, the Lord desires that all people be saved. Yet at the same time, not everyone will be saved. And that takes us to the next word, and that is the word call. We're moving fast through these. Call. We come back to Romans chapter 8. It says, And these whom he predestined, he also called. And so the word call, kaleo, it means to invite, to summon. You know, there's two types of calls. There's the outward call, there's the inward call. 
The outward call is what anybody who sits under the sound of the preaching of the gospel receives. The inward call is what we call the effectual call. That is the call that tells a person, you need to come here now. I always use the story about myself when I was growing up as a little kid and I'd be playing in the alley and I've told you all this and my mother would be calling my name and she'd say, hey, you know, you need to come in the house. And I would hear her calling my name and I'd be out there with my friends and i ignore that call. That was an outward call. But then she would change the tone of her voice and she would start calling me by my full name. And I knew right then that I needed to get up, stop what I was doing. And I needed to come immediately. We say that call, I say that call was effectual because it accomplished its intended purpose. And so the effectual call, if you're looking for somebody in Scripture, Lydia, Acts chapter 16. Lydia on one Sabbath day in Acts chapter 16 was sitting, she was listening, and she heard Paul preaching the gospel. There was a lot of people around who heard Paul preach the gospel that day, on that Sabbath. But the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message because faith is a gift from God. But then, the next one is justified. And to be justified is to be declared righteous. To be declared righteous. It's as, it's, as, it's as if God declares us not guilty. It, when we place our faith in Christ, we are declared righteous. And when we're declared righteous, we receive the righteousness of Christ so that we look like Christ. Because on the cross, Christ looked like us. But then finally, there's glory. So, what do we glean from this? We see the, the foreknown, the predestined, the called, the justified will also be glorified. So, glorification is the time in the future when every single believer, follower of Christ, will share in his glory. We are moving from glory to glory. There is waiting for us an eternal weight of glory. Hence, as we started this, Paul said what in verse 18? For I consider that the present or the that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Because there's one, there's coming a day when we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, changed incorruptible. Change triumphantly and victoriously. There's coming a day when death will be swallowed up in victory. And so we will be glorified. And so we covered a lot of territory. Looked at a lot of different concepts. Are there any questions? Questions? Jesus chose the disciples. Yes, good question. <laughs> he chose they were, Judas. They, they were not saved. He chose them. You know, I mean, as we as we talk about like people being saved, you know what I mean? Uh. Well, I I mean, I guess I don't understand. I. W w when you say that, what do you, what do you mean? Well, I'm saying he went out and chose, okay? He chose those 12. Mm -hmm. He didn't chose any 12. He, yeah, he chose them, yeah. Yeah, he chose those 12. Yes. 
But those 12 he chose before he chose them, you know, they were not saved people. Uh, I, I mean, I would say they were under the Old Testament economy in the sense that um, let me say it this way Old Testament saints they were still at that particular time are you saying when you say they were not saved the way we see salvation are you saying they were still under the Old Testament economy because Jesus was not he had not been crucified yet so there was a sense in which they were saved like Abraham was. Because Old Testament saints were saved just like New Testament saints are. In that Abraham believed God and it was credited unto him as righteousness. But, but at first, Abraham didn't know God. Yeah, at first he was a pagan at first. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he, he was a pagan. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't think these apostles knew God. There was some stuff that they did not know. They yeah. were, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, one of them was the devil. I mean, he even said, he said, I chose you. Right. And yet one of you is the devil. So there was a sense that uh, they probably did not have a full understanding of what Jesus came to do with me. Yeah. There was probably a sense in which they, you know, they were, you know, they were trying to figure that thing out themselves in many respects because you know, up until the point of the crucifixion and even afterwards, mm -hmm. they were still thinking that the Messiah was going to come and restore the kingdom right. of Israel. Mm -hmm. And like King David did. And uh, so, did they have faith in God? I would say yes. Did they have a full understanding of what the Messiah would be like we do? I would say they were growing in that. And I say one of them was the devil. Mm -hmm. Judas is scary. <laughs> Did you have a question? I was just gonna say, uh, with the moment when he saved them, uh, mm -hmm. when he called them, um, when he called them? when he called them, well, when he first of all he knew. Cause when we speak about being foreign, when yeah, he foreknew, he already knew it before. Mm -hmm. Is that what y'all hitting at? Uh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. So he already knew before. So they were. So when he called them, they were saved in a sense. Jesus would, I mean, he he wouldn't choose people that he know that his spirit wouldn't dwell in. Well, he chose Judas. He chose Judas. Well, that's true. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He chose Judas. And he foreknew. He knew Judas. He chose Judas. Yeah. It was, you know, it was not God's desire. It was not God's will that uh, Judas uh, sinned in betraying Jesus, but uh, the sin of Judas fulfilled uh, God's purpose. It, it fulfilled God's purpose. And so uh, I think when it comes to the will of God, even when uh, God's purpose to call in calling individuals, uh, again, I think we have to distinguish between the outward and inward call. And uh, there are many who are called and few who are chosen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And so there's the... I always say the will of God's desire and the will of God's decree. God's will of desire. God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 and 4. He desires, but yet what God desires does not always come to pass and is often resisted. God's will of decree his will of decree is that which comes to pass and cannot be resisted so with 
in the group of the original 12. There was still yet one who was not the real deal. Called, received the outward call, responded, called, followed Jesus, walked alongside Jesus, looked like the real deal with Jesus, but he was not saved. Hence, I say that they were, they received the call, some, they all received the outward call. Probably only uh, 11 who received the effectual call because even with the effectual call, even when we respond to the effectual call, it doesn't necessarily mean that we know everything there is to know about Jesus at that moment. Uh, when we get saved, there's still this, uh, even with us today, there's still this, uh, this growth and maturity. And so what I know today is nowhere close to what I knew when I first got saved. All I knew is that Jesus would save me from my sins. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. Amen. And so now, come 20 plus years later, I know a little bit more than that. <laughs> Just a little bit, you know. Just a little bit more than that. And so, but Old Testament saints were saved the same way as New Testament saints are saved. And that is, they're saved by, we're saved by faith. Like Abraham. Abraham was a pagan before he got saved. Uh, Judas called 12, I mean, Jesus called 12. Judas was the son of perdition. And so, yeah, God even desired that all Jerusalem be saved. I mean, in Matthew 23, 37, you know, he talks about, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. He kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. God desired that all Jerusalem would be, would be saved, but he had not decreed it. He had not decreed that all Jerusalem would be saved. And so there was once, you know, Judas, you know, he's the one. He's the, uh, he's the one that uh, resisted. He was not the real deal, even though he looked like the real deal. That's a good question. Good questions. Any other questions? A lot of territory again. We covered some of these terms. I could we could spend the next six, several months discussing this, this, this topic right here. But this is it's designed to give us a general overview of uh, it's a very controversial issue because you know, on one side of the camp, you got those who believe in free will. And on the other side of the camp, you got those who don't. And uh, I don't believe the will is free. I believe the will is fallen. <laughs> so I believe that we choose according to our strongest desires. So in our fallenness, unless God gives us a new heart, uh, we cannot choose God apart from God regenerating our hearts. So that enables us to even uh, respond to the effectual call. I believe that regeneration precedes faith. And uh, so he gives us a new heart that enables us to respond in faith to the gospel message. Any other questions? I wish we could. Uh, I done kept y'all a long time. And, uh, but, you know, anyway, it's a blessing anyway. We got hope for the future. We got freedom in the future. And so, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
lamp to our feet, light for our path. Continue, Lord, to give us wisdom and insight from your word for our living. We thank you now, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.